Antarctica, the most undiscovered continent on Earth, and for very good reasons. Freezing temperatures and deadly storms have defeated many explorers and scientists seeking to understand this mysterious land on which man has never lived. Today, they know enough to survive this beautiful though hostile place, but events are now unfolding here that may spell disaster for the rest of the world. What we find here today is unnerving. Glaciers are melting rapidly into the ocean, threatening to flood the world's coastlines. Penguins are walking off to their death in inexplicable suicide marches. Seals are struck blind by ultraviolet rays. Starfish are unable to reproduce. And the continent's largest land animal, a creature smaller than a common housefly, is facing possible extinction. And now, on newly exposed rocky landscapes, seeing sunlight for the very first time, green vegetation is thriving in the world's largest desert. Has an irreversible environmental change begun here? Or can we, as a global community, work together to save our planet as well as ourselves? This is the Antarctica Challenge. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, global temperatures have been increasing steadily for the past 100 years, with seven of the eight warmest years on record occurring since 2001. The most dramatic rise has been here, in Antarctica, as scientists from every discipline search for clues and hopefully answers. Warming temperatures here mean melting ice, and that means flooding for the rest of the world. Dr. Julian Scott, a geophysicist with the British Antarctic Survey, believes we have to prepare for this catastrophe today. Adding the water to the ocean will cause more flooding, and uh, we'll need to put up more flood defenses and, and build our cities uh, in, an, in a different way because of it. Pine Island is one of Antarctica's largest glaciers, over 250 kilometers long, approximately the distance between New York City and Boston, and two kilometers thick, it is the greatest contributor of ice flow into the ocean of any ice drainage basin in the world. In this time-lapse photography of a melting glacier, we can see just how quickly large areas of ice can move from the rocky shores to the sea. Through his extensive study, Dr. Scott has found that Pine Island Glacier alone is currently adding 46 gigatons of fresh water to the world's sea level every year. The main reason the glacier is increasing its speed at the moment is, uh, is thought uh, by most scientists working on the area to be due to uh, warm ocean water. Now this isn't necessarily water that's been affected by atmospheric changes in, in, the, in the recent uh, history. This is deep ocean water off the edge of the continental shelf that is somehow being 
pushed up onto the uh, continental shelf by the uh, wind patterns and the, uh, the, the pressure systems in, in Antarctica and shifting warm water right to the area of this glacier where it starts to float. Now this is thinning this area of the glacier and by thinning this floating portion of the glacier this causes a reduction in the, the pressure uh, which, which means there's less holding the glacier back which means it can speed up. Another cause of the faster moving ice is the warming of the newly exposed rock that extends beneath the ice. As the sun warms this bare rock, it creates an endothermic reaction that heats the rock bed and melts the ice from underneath. Antarctica holds 70% of the world's fresh water in its ice. According to NASA, if the land ice of the west coast of the continent alone were to melt, the world's sea level would rise 18 to 20 feet. This would result in massive flooding around the world, as well as increased weight and pressure on the world's seabed. This, in turn, could provide severe stress on oceanic fault lines, resulting in earthquakes and tsunamis. Even the ozone hole may be contributing to this problem by the way it has changed weather patterns here. Now one theory that's been suggested is it actually could be anthropogenic, but due to the ozone hole over Antarctica, which has been shown to change the weather systems around Antarctica, or we could be uh, seeing El Nino type effects in the, in the southern weather systems, that the wind is driving this ocean water up to the, the front of the glacier. There's a huge uh, ice sheet grounded largely below sea level, uh, which is why we, we are concerned about it. Uh, but the ice is very thick and extends way above sea level. So obviously if we were to lose it, it would contribute to the, the global sea levels. And in fact, the whole of the West Antarctic ice sheet could contribute uh, up to five meters. And the Amundsen Sea area, where Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers are, that, that have both been noted to be speeding up recently, uh, that could contribute around one and a half meters to global sea level. Dr. Scott is one of many scientists dedicated to studying Antarctica. He spends long periods of study in the field, but returns home to analyze his findings. His headquarters are located here, half a world away, in the historic university town of Cambridge, England. His research, along with others at the British Antarctic Survey, pays tribute to the first scientific expeditions in Antarctica 100 years ago. While many ships and lives were lost in those early days by explorers the world over, it was one British explorer who was perhaps best known for paving the way for scientific study here today, Sir Ernest Shackleton. In 1909, he led one of the very first scientific expeditions to Antarctica. Ernest Shackleton really filled the old dictionary definition of an explorer, one who explores to discover new lands. There are very few new lands left to discover, under the sea possibly, and of course in space in the future. But for scientists, there are always new lands and they never stop discovering. Well, during the early expeditions, uh, polar science was really a matter of observation more than very precise science. I mean, they didn't have the gear. But a lot of scientific research was accomplished during the Nimrod expedition. And they did accomplish some notable firsts. They did discover the South, the South Magnetic Pole, which is not a fixed point, but moves about about six miles a year. That was enough for Shackleton to secure a second expedition. However, this time, it didn't turn out as expected. When the ship became um, trapped in the ice, it was hoped that she would rise above it and be able to be floated once more, but instead she was slowly crushed. They watched with horror 
as, as, as this took place, eventually the mast came down. And the, you see the group, the rather desolate on the ice, their home, because the, the ship is always a sailor's home, gone. They were in a very dangerous situation. No one knew where they were. Shackleton and his crew were left stranded and fighting for their lives for over a year and a half. Amazingly, Shackleton led his endurance crew back to safety without losing one life. Their incredible story of survival is commemorated by one of Antarctica's very few museums. With many of their supplies still on its shelves, this unique museum provides an eerie reminder of how difficult survival is in this harsh land. A struggle which helped give inspiration to an international treaty 50 years later. For the first time in human history, 12 nations were able to agree to administer an entire continent. Signed on December 1, 1959, the Antarctica Treaty bans any military activity and restricts any human occupation solely to scientific study. Never before has the world come together to jointly govern a continent rather than fight over its ownership. Today, there are 47 nations ensuring the peaceful use of Antarctica strictly for scientific research. One of the more recent countries to sign the treaty is Ukraine. Dr. Eugeni Karyagin is a seismologist from Ukraine. His country joined the treaty in 1992 and took over Great Britain's Faraday Research Station, renaming it Vernadsky Station. He believes that the melting fresh water is contributing to the further melting of the ice in a very unusual way. На мой взгляд, увеличение температуры в районе Антарктиды приведёт к тому, что больше снега будет таять, то что больше ледников будет, больше масса льда будет обрушаться из ледников, а это в свою очередь приведёт к снижению уровня солености води. Больше будет процесс опреснения, что может привести к увеличению массы воды, которая будет испаряться в атмосферу. Это, в свою очередь, может привести уже к большему проценту выпадения осадка в виде дождя и снега. Вот в этом году, в декабре, в декабре этого года, уровень снега получил свое максимальное значение, где-то приблизительно 1 метр 80 сантиметров. Этих, этих осадков было больше, чем зимой. То есть летом выпало снега больше, чем зимой здесь, в Антарктиде. Доктор Кериаген warns that the increased precipitation will accelerate the melting of the glacier ice, compounding and accelerating the process as more fresh water from the melting land ice dilutes the salt water of the Antarctic Ocean. Since fresh water evaporates faster than salt water, there will be a lot more rain and snow here. Over the past 20 years, the continent of Antarctica has diminished in size dramatically, shrinking the ice fields at an alarming rate. How much further can Antarctica shrink before its melting ice floods the world? Dr. Karyagin is measuring this melting every day through a series of seismology tests designed to record shifts in glacial movement. Здесь на станции я провожу сейсмические исследования, и одним из интересных таких моментов моей работы это исследование состояния ледовой активности на континенте и вообще вокруг станции, в акватории. Два года тому назад я начал подсчитывать количество 
э, сигналов, которые генерируются от э, ближайшего ледника на континентальной части. Доктор Кариаган has been recording vibrations from nearby glaciers. He claims that the increased frequency of seismic signals tells him that the climate is warming. Могу сказать, что в день регистрировал порядка около 1000 сигналов. Это сигналы от обрушений ледовой кромки ледников, что все-таки заметно потепление климата идет увеличение средней температуры и, скорее всего, этот процесс провоцирует увеличение количества сигналов. Вот. На мой взгляд, увеличение количества сигналов, которые генерируются ближайшими ледниками, свидетельствует о некотором увеличении температуры в районе Антарктиды. If he's right, more glaciers will soon resemble this one, diluting the sea with fresh ice water at unprecedented speeds. At this continued rate, it could mean catastrophic flooding for most of the coastal towns and cities of the planet. Are we too late? Is there anything we can do now to slow and perhaps even reverse this continent's warming to prevent world flooding? Most scientists predict that the world's coastal towns and cities will be hit the hardest by the rising sea levels and the ensuing hurricanes, earthquakes and tsunamis. Coastal cities that are the center of life to millions are at peril. Cities like San Francisco. This picturesque coastal city in California is the occasional home of renowned environmentalist and penguin specialist, Dr. David Ainley, who after spending more than 30 years in the field in Antarctica, has likely spent more time there than here. His contribution to scientific study in Antarctica is so significant, a mountain there has been named after him, Ainley's Peak. He believes that cities like his will soon have some serious environmental issues to deal with. I think we uh, are gonna see some major problems. Uh, we, we are too late by 20 years and um, I mean, it's really serious. Well, anybody that lives on the coast is going to be having problems. It doesn't take much of a rise in sea level, just an inch, and that's huge when you get a storm surge, you know, from a nor'easter or a hurricane or that sort of thing. You know, if foreclosures are happening on beachfront, that's probably a good thing because those, those properties are history anyway. And while today's Antarctic scientists are suggesting we need to relocate to higher ground, the penguins here are already being forced to do the same thing. There are up to seven species of penguins that might occur in the Antarctic. Four of those are relatively common. And if we start from the largest, the emperor penguin, it's the one that is least tolerant to temperature changes. It's the one that nests the further south, the one that nests in the coldest climates. Next would be the Adelie penguin. They're very much dependent on ice flows and the near ice conditions for hunting. So they again would be very much affected by rising temperature changes. The chinstrap penguin is somewhere in between. It is more adaptive. It will move further north and further south than some of the other ones. But the one behind me, the Gentoo, is probably the most adaptive. It's the one that might be the super penguin of the Antarctic eventually. As well, warming waters are responsible for a drastic decline in the penguin's sole food source, the krill. Krill are small shrimp-like marine crustaceans. They're the primary food supply of penguins and all other Antarctic animal life. They travel in schools of millions and are very sensitive to water temperature. 
A rise in temperature of even half a degree hinders their ability to reproduce, seriously impacting the penguins here. Compounding this problem is that more whales are entering these waters now that they have become warmer. In one gulp, these whales can consume a quantity of krill that would otherwise feed 2,000 penguins. If the krill move out of the area entirely, these penguins have to find another food source, and most of them won't be able to. When krill's available, all of the species of, of smaller penguins, the Adelie, the Chinstrap, and the, the Gentoo, will eat them almost exclusively. It's only when the krill is, is in, in diminishing numbers that they will return to other species. Well, if there's no food, there's no birds, pretty simply. Uh, as the food resources change, it's only the species that are able to adapt that are going to survive. The other species, such as the Adelie, the Emperor, will have to either stay south or move south into the colder waters and try to catch the krill that are still there. Over the past 25 years, the population of the Adelie penguins here in the Antarctic Peninsula has dropped by 50%, while the chinstrap numbers have fallen by as much as 65%. But the most noticeable relocation recently has been among the Gentoos. The biggest change that's occurred here is the movement of the Gentoo. They're moving further south, they're moving south in greater numbers, they're moving higher up onto the slopes. When you have small numbers of them, they will nest in the near shore areas. As the population increases in a preferred nesting locale, they'll move up slope. So we have penguins behind me, we have penguins on a, a higher slope to the right, and then sometimes we'll get penguins even higher up on the slope behind. So while it looks as though the Gen 2 is poised to take over the warming west coast of Antarctica, the retreating penguin species are moving to the colder climates down the coast. And individual penguins have begun wandering off to certain death. A phenomenon only recently observed in the past five years. Viewed by many as suicide marches, lone penguins have been observed to leave their colony, walk away from the sea, and venture deep into the continent, never to return. Penguin scientist Dr. David Ainley has been studying penguin behavior for 40 years, most of those years in the field in Antarctica. His theory is that these so-called suicidal penguins are actually pioneers, a kind of noble explorer who ventures out on his own to find a new home for his colony. We have these individual penguins that purportedly are committing suicide by walking away from the sea into the interior of the Antarctic, kind of like Scott did. When these populations expand, it's because of uh, pioneers that find new places. They go off and disappear, and nobody hears about them anymore, unless they have a good publicist. This unusual behavior was first noted when an iceberg measuring 97 nautical miles came to rest at the shore of a large penguin colony, effectively blocking access to their food supply. And so this big iceberg, B-15A, parked itself in the southern Ross Sea. And so there was a lot of disoriented penguins during those five years that essentially have this 97 mile long fence that went across the Ross Sea. So during those five years, there, there was an increase in the numbers of these penguins that were really beside themselves about which way to go and which would get them to where they wanted to go. Several more of these penguins that were going the wrong way, so to speak. And these would be the heroes that penguins would write about. However, Without the warming temperatures that placed giant icebergs in their path, there would be no heroic penguins looking for a new home for their tribe. Suicide missions aside, 
the relocation of penguin populations is taking a significant toll on their numbers. As well, global warming and the ozone hole have combined to threaten penguin populations across the continent and may very well cause their extinction. For many penguin species, warming temperatures have reduced the size of ice flows, upon which species such as the emperor penguin hatch their young. Combined with the increased winds resulting from the ozone hole, entire colonies of baby chicks are being blown off the ice to certain death. But as is being shown at uh, Point Geology, um, that colony has decreased by 50% since the mid-70s. And partially it is related to the, um, the fact that this, the fast ice has become too thin and so it gets blown out repeatedly and um, many eggs and chicks are blown away on the ice you know, with parents sitting on them. It's okay with the parents, you know, they're used to water, but so that this is happening with greater frequency. Also occurring with greater frequency is an extended period of dependency by young penguins on their parents for food. Young Gen 2 such as this one have usually begun to collect food for themselves by now, yet more and more of these penguins have been observed to be relying on their parents. Penguins far beyond the age of nestling are having trouble leaving the nest as it were, perhaps afraid to face the relatively bleak prospects of their diminishing food supplies. Failed mating attempts such as this one have been observed more and more in the past five years, suggesting the birds are becoming more disoriented, perhaps another result of their difficulty in adapting to the rapidly changing environment. Another cause for concern, especially among the younger penguins, is the increase in attacks from a predatory bird known as the skua. Usually these birds only attack the eggs of penguins, but as the number of eggs has been reduced, the skua has now become a predator of baby chicks. And since these birds prefer a warmer climate and a rocky shore to live on, more of them are entering the peninsula area, providing the remaining penguin population something they are not used to, a predator. While the warmer climate in Antarctica is impacting on the survival of the once plentiful penguin populations, the increased temperatures are also resulting in the decline of Antarctica's only indigenous land animal, the common fly. Okay, what we've been looking at here are little tiny terrestrial invertebrates that are the main animal fauna on the Antarctic Peninsula. But they're virtually the only fauna you see in the Antarctic. And what I've been looking at specifically here is a little fly. There are only two real flies in Antarctica, and this is one of them. It's the, it's the largest land, land animal in Antarctica, and if you're lucky, it's about four or five millimeters long and about half a milligram in weight. So it's a, a really rather a small, cute little insect, basically. It's a fly without any wings. Uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, it's one, of the, it's one of the three fastest warming parts of the planet at the moment. And these little invertebrates, and in their distribution, 
are potentially sensitive, sensitive to these changes. So if it gets warmer, as it, as it is doing, they can carry out their life cycle quicker. What this means is they die faster. The warmer habitat here can be deadly. The barren rock now being exposed by melting ice is very dry, depriving the creatures of water. It doesn't have very good water holding capacity. If you warm it up, and particularly if you have increased amounts of sunshine, direct sunshine landing on it, um, it actually dries out more quickly. So you actually may end up with a warmer habitat, but one in which there's no water available. Now that combination of effects is actually then negative on these little invertebrates. And while warming temperatures are creating deadly environments for Antarctica's land animals, the warmer waters are having the same effect for Antarctica's marine life. Laura Grange is a marine biologist working with the British Antarctic Survey at their Rothra Research Station. She tells us that an anticipated increase of only two degrees in water temperature will cause starfish and other marine life to stop reproducing. This is a starfish. All these animals are actually collected from the shallow water around the Rothera Research Station, and they're all collected by scuba diving. And it's also incredibly colorful, which is easily shown on this starfish. We collect them directly from outside, and then we bring them in to carry out various experiments on them. I'm actually looking at their breeding success from year to year. They're also very important because they're very sensitive to temperature change. Um, and many scientists have actually predicted that there will possibly be a global temperature change of two degrees within the next 100 years. Well, these animals in particular are very susceptible or very sensitive to changes in temperature. And therefore, because of this predicted change, both regionally but also globally, it's very unlikely that they won't be affected. And in my case, for my work, if they're not able to breed, obviously they won't be able to survive. And while global warming in Antarctica seems to be a significant threat to its fauna, the flora seems to be experiencing a genesis in what is commonly referred to as the world's largest desert. Daniela Rubling, a sub-Antarctic botany researcher, describes a new vegetation here that she has not seen before. It looks to be a combination of uh, moss type uh, plant as well as potentially some algae as well, but basically chlorophyllic species that do use photosynthesis in order to produce their food and to produce to grow and to survive. And uh, it's very interesting to see it in this type of area because mo most of the time these islands are covered by snow, they're covered by ice, they don't see light. and so to see greenery in an area that has always been considered to be a desert, it's very interesting and exciting to see new life growing in places where it's never been previously. But perhaps the biggest mystery of the greening of Antarctica is where this new life came from. Was it always here, lying dormant in the rocky soil? Or was it brought here by birds or winds? Well, I mean, the, the seeds or the spores of these plants may have been carried in by winds, um, and this may have been occurring for hundreds of years, but because it's been covered in snow, these plants have not been able to establish themselves. Whereas now, once you get exposure of rock, you get soil deposition, allowing these seeds or spores to establish themselves and grow in areas where they would never have been before. And does it stop there? Is this possibly the beginning of an entirely new ecosystem? This type of vegetation, it can serve as both um, food supply for, for animals that 
need to convert the plant material into energy for themselves, but also in and amongst you can see that it could also provide shelter or protection from it for animals as well or for smaller invertebrates. I mean, the possibilities are are for more life to grow and for more species to find their way here and establish themselves as well. But in order to predict how severe climate change will affect this continent, and by extension the rest of the world, a series of measurements and data recordings is done on a daily basis by devoted scientists the world over in what is often a thankless yet essential job. Recording temperatures from the past and projecting a tendency to continue is not a very reliable method of forecast given the wildly changing atmospheric and meteorological conditions here. Down we go. Okay. One of the more accurate methods involves ice core sampling. Where I'm sitting, the ice is 950 meters thick. If I drilled through all the way to the bedrock, I would have recovered ice spanning the last 40,000 years. This is quite an important period. 40,000 years ago, the Earth was in an ice age. Today, we're in a warm period. By analyzing the record of the climate from the bottom of the core to the top, I'll be able to see how we move from a cold period into a warm period. And this helps us understand how we expect the climate to change over the next 100 years. a nice piece of cork, about two meters long, and round about here is 500 meters depth from the surface. That's ice that fell as snow about 5,800 years ago. Many things in the atmosphere change from summer to winter, and we can see this in the ice cores when we analyze them. So when we plot out our results, we see a series of waves going down the ice, and these are a summer, winter, summer, winter. So we can simply count the layers, just like counting tree rings. Once we get the two meter ice core back to the surface, then we pack it into insulated boxes, and then it's shipped by small aircraft back to one of our coastal stations, Halley Bay, where it's loaded onto one of our ships, and it's shipped back to Europe in a refrigerated container. Once it gets back to Europe, we cut it into much smaller pieces and send each of these pieces out to different laboratories for different analyses to try to understand all the things that are happening in the climate and the atmosphere. This study has shown that the increase of greenhouse gases found in the air bubbles is directly proportionate to the increase in size of the ozone hole. And what if the hole gets bigger? How many lives might be at risk as a result of the cancer-inducing UV rays? One of the most important areas of study in Antarctica today is the ozone hole. As its regularly increasing size approaches human habitats such as New Zealand, the related increase in cases of skin cancer has made ozone study a high priority. At Vernadsky Station, ozone scientist Igor Gavatsky, 
keeps a daily vigil of recording ozone readings every three hours. To do this, he uses a Dobson ozone spectrophotometer, an instrument used by the British Antarctic Survey to study the ozone hole. The hole was discovered in 1985 by Dr. Jonathan Shanklin using this very device. Well, this sort of white box that we've got in front of us is the Dobson ozone spectrophotometer. And as you might guess from the fact that it's got ozone in its name, it's for measuring ozone in the atmosphere above us. And we can see on the top of the instrument this black um, tube with the prism at the top. And that allows us to direct a beam of sunlight into the instrument. Now this sunlight has come through the Earth's atmosphere, through the ozone layer, and it's slightly changed that beam, particularly in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And what we do inside the instrument is select out those wavelengths or parts of the ultraviolet spectrum that have been affected by the ozone. And by looking at the ratio of intensity of two wavelengths, we can work out how much ozone was in the path from the instrument to the sun. And the observer would make some adjustments on the levers and the dial to either select the wavelength or to find out what the absorption was. So it's essentially a very simple design, designed by an Oxford professor of physics in the 1920s, and it's still the world standard for measuring ozone from the ground. Measurements recorded here on Galandez Island detail the amount of ozone in the atmosphere. Recent measurements have ranged from 270 to 300 Dobsons, and this is good news. A measurement of 260 or less is dangerous for people and animals. This allows all wavelengths of ultraviolet rays through, burning unprotected skin in five minutes and blinding Antarctica's land animals. This Waddell seal, for example, has been blinded by UV rays, and this is becoming an increasing problem. There seems to be evidence that the changes in the ozone hole are having an effect on climate change here as well. The changes in the ozone hole certainly have been driving some of the changes that we've seen in, in surface climate. I think that's, that's now pretty well established that uh, one of the big changes in Antarctic climate over the last 30 years or so has been that the westerly winds that blow around the continent have speeded up by maybe 20 percent and we now think that a, a large part of that is due to the reduction of, of ozone in the stratosphere. Since its discovery in 1985 by Dr. Jonathan Shanklin, the hole has been getting bigger every week. Now that it has reached an area in excess of 25 million square kilometers, the size of North America, it has, for the very first time, stopped growing. This year's ozone hole has actually been quite unusual. Quite often, it's not a circular thing. It can be quite elliptical. And sometimes when it's elliptical, it sweeps northwards over the tip of South America, the Falkland Islands, and South Georgia. And that can usually happen once every few weeks. This year it's only happened once. The hole has remained very, very circular and consequently very stable. The reason for this, many scientists believe, has been the Montreal Protocol, an urgently created global initiative to ban the use of gases that destroy ozone, such as chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. The treaty was signed on September 16, 1987, by almost all the nations of the world, and the results have made a difference. Timor-Leste, uh, San Marino, and Andorra are the three that haven't signed up. Uh, everybody else has signed up to the basic protocol, and it's working. It's really quite amazing. The amount of these ozone-destroying substances in the atmosphere is clearly dropping. Um, it will take a few years before what we see at the surface filters through to the high atmosphere above Antarctica. But nevertheless, I think even in Antarctica, we're starting to see the amount of ozone destroying substances go down. But it's a slow process because they're very stable. And it's probably going to be another 
decade before we can be certain that things are actually improving. But we can confidently say that we're on the right track. And while Dr. Shanklin believes the reduction of our use of CFCs is the reason why the ozone hole has stopped growing, his counterpart in Antarctica, Igor Vazdowski, has recorded measurements that suggest that the hole is actually shrinking. Проте можна сказати, що от порівнюючи із попередніми роками, все-таки дірка, ну, от трішки зменшується, вона має іншу, менш стабільну таку свою природу. Це теж є добре. The correlation between the worldwide CFC ban and the reversal of the ozone hole size will hopefully encourage further collective efforts to help reduce the damage to ourselves and our planet. The Montreal Protocol, together with the signing of the Antarctica Treaty, have proven to be two unprecedented international cooperatives that ended up protecting the Earth's environment. No territorial disputes, no military presence, no natural resource mining, no commercial interests, no residential land claims. Antarctica is unique in so many ways. It is the driest, windiest, highest and coldest continent on Earth. We can now add to that list that it is the only place on Earth where the world has come together in peace to affect environmental change for the betterment of all life. No matter how insurmountable the environmental crisis may seem to be, we have proven that with an internationally united effort, we can answer the call to any challenge. Even the Antarctica challenge. There's no denying the effects of global warming on our planet. Countries around the world have been experiencing record temperatures for years, but none more pronounced than right here in Antarctica. I'm standing in beautiful Neko Harbor here, where the temperatures have increased hugely in the past five years. Um, five years ago, the idea of swimming in Antarctica was not only ludicrous, but actually impossible, because most of the shoreline water was frozen. However, as you can see over my shoulder, the water is not frozen. And the temperature today is a balmy 8 degrees Celsius. And to me, that sounds like a good temperature for a swim. So here I go. <laughs> okay, we'll see you in a bit.
So there you have it, swimming, Antarctica's newest sport.